Teller's Tachyon Tablets is a proud sponsor of Eager Space. Worn out after a long day of asteroid mining? Frazzled by FTL fatigue? Step up today to Teller's Tachyon Tablets, the premium hyperspatial restorative. The last nuclear rocket engines were tested about 50 years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of claims about nuclear thermal engines, and it's not clear what they can really do. NASA has recently started a nuclear propulsion program. What is the program about and what can we expect from it? I'm sure some of you are saying, another nuclear rocket video? I've done a couple. The most recent one is linked in the corner if you care. When I started on this one, I figured I could just put up a slide that says, nuclear thermal rockets are stupid, and be done with it. Not much of a video really, and not a lot to motivate me to cover the same ground for a third time. So I did some writing, got bored, and went on to other topics. Then a few weeks later I came back to it and took another look. And I am persuaded that this program is a good idea, which is a stunning reversal. Don't get me wrong, I still think this is a fairly transparent effort to channel some of that sweet, sweet NASA money into the bank accounts of companies that have words like nuclear or atomic in their names. But it's more than that. Here are my reasons. The first reason is that this program is not about building a nuclear rocket engine. Take away all the rockety parts like turbo pumps and hydrogen tanks and nozzles. This is a program about building a nuclear rocket engine reactor. The second reason is that this isn't actually a NASA program, though NASA is paying for it. The program is being run by the U.S. Department of Energy, which is the central point for nuclear activities in the U.S. government. DOE has very specific ideas on how nuclear projects should be done, and that means that this is about building a real react, and by real I mean practical to make, robust, safe, and all the other things you would want in any nuclear reactor. This is categorically different than the here's a paper about a nuclear rocket engine approach that I've seen so often. The DOE has chosen Idaho National Laboratory as the location where this work will be managed, and the operation of this laboratory is contracted to Bechtel. If you read the documents, contractor means Bechtel, as they are coordinating the program, and subcontractor means a company that will be participating in the program. It's a little confusing. The third reason came after reading Lori Garver's Escaping Gravity book, where she talks in depth about NASA existing to do things for the country. This is NASA's mission statement. NASA explores the unknown in air and space, innovates for the benefit of humanity, and inspires the world through discovery. This is exactly the kind of research that NASA should be doing. Whether nuclear thermal engines are practical is a significant unknown, and if it can be answered, it will affect future planning. So yes, I am persuaded. The details of the process are in this document that I'll link to in the description. If you understand what NASA did with commercial resupply and commercial crew for ISS, this multi-phase approach will look familiar. It's based on the standard approach used by Department of Energy projects. The first part is the conceptual design, also known as phase one for this project. The goal is to complete the conceptual design to a 30% level and is this feasible level of detail and then complete a review. Any subcontractors that complete that 30% review successfully will be eligible to move to the next phase. Phase two is known as the preliminary design phase and will be awarded with a separate contract, very likely for much more money. In it, the subcontractor needs to mature their 30% design to a 90% design to feed into the 90% design review. Any subcontractor who successfully passes this phase will have the opportunity to participate in Phase 3. Phase 3 involves creating two prototype reactors, one unfueled and one fully fueled and ready for testing. Successful completion of Phase 3 presumably means NASA would be looking at flight hardware to be tested in orbit. NASA has not specified a reactor design, though there are a few obvious possibilities. I expect a Nerva-like design, but I'm really hoping one of the contractors will try a pebble bed design. There are a number of requirements the design must meet. 
The first requirement is that the engine will use uranium that is 5 to 20 percent uranium-235. This precludes some of the early designs that used uranium that was highly enriched to more than 90 percent uranium-235. You can be sure that everybody is going to specify 20 percent, as going lower than that just makes their lives harder. Interestingly, the congressional authorization that set up this program said, use low enriched uranium if feasible, and NASA decided to make that a requirement. I view that as a good thing. The second requirement is to use hydrogen as a propellant, though reaction mass is perhaps a better term than propellant as it is heated, not burned. No other comment here as hydrogen is the only propellant that is going to meet the other requirements. One of the possible advantages of nuclear thermal engines is their higher specific impulse, which gives them better fuel economy. The goal is to reach a specific impulse of 900 seconds, roughly double what the best chemical rockets can do, and that requires a reactor outlet temperature of 2700 Kelvin to achieve the required exhaust velocity. 900 seconds ISP translates to 8829 meters per second in exhaust velocity, and that requires roughly 2500 Kelvin, so 2700 should get them to that level of performance. The thrust requirement is 55.6 kilonewtons. They express it as a hydrogen flow rate to ensure that the engine preserves the target specific impulse of 900 even at maximum thrust. This is almost precisely half of the thrust available from an RL10 engine. That's pretty small as engines go. There is a second thrust requirement of 111.2 kilonewtons. Read this as, you should be able to scale your engine up to RL10 size. I'm not excited about this second requirement. I can see an argument for starting small. A program to develop a smaller reactor is likely cheaper, but the way that you scale up to a bigger size is by making the core longer or fatter, and that affects both the reactor design and the rest of the rocket engine. The big problem here is I don't understand what is required to meet this part of the requirement. A contractor could just do both designs, and that would be great, but what if they choose not to do that? Do they just promise that it will work in a bigger version with little or no additional technology development? If NASA wants an RL10 sized engine, they should just specify that as the size. We all know what happens with a Block 1, Block 2 approach. NASA will accept a reactor that masses 3,500 kilograms, but hopes it will be as light as 2,500 kilograms. The mass numbers here, and those quoted for other nuclear thermal designs, tend to be pretty weaselly, as nobody has built real systems with them. We have actual numbers from NERVA, but they were never designed to be light, so that doesn't matter. For this design, the minimum thrust-to-mass ratio is 1.6, but they hope for 2.3. We can compare to a couple of proposed engines. The simple nuclear rocket engine that was commonly referenced at NASA comes in at 2,500 kilograms for 72.9 kilonewtons of thrust for a ratio of 2.9, and the enhanced SNRE at 3,250 kilograms for 111.7 kilonewtons of thrust for a ratio of 3.5. This requirement really disappoints me. Many nuclear thermal advocates talk about light reactors with advanced materials, and this is quite a bit worse than the ones that were proposed 20 plus years ago. Note that that does not include the rockety parts, the turbo pumps, the nozzle, etc., though those are fairly light. The majority of nuclear thermal reactor designs use an internal shield inside of the reactor vessel to reduce the amount of radiation exiting the pressure vessel, and a larger external shield outside the reactor. Those are likely to be heavy structures. There is a list of reactor components that should be part of the mass estimate, and shielding is not listed. I'd be happier if there was a requirement for the maximum radiation coming out of the reactor, so that the shielding mass would count and the designs would be on equal footings. Just to compare, the RL-10 has a thrust to mass of about 47. The reactor must maintain full power thrust for two hours minimum, preferably for five hours. This is the total operational time across multiple starts. It should also be capable of five starts and shutdowns. This is unfortunately not well defined. A start is defined as going to operational power levels, but the word operational is not defined. A shutdown is defined as occurring from any power level. Why is this important? During NERVA, there were ongoing problems with erosion of the fuel elements due to the hot hydrogen. There were also issues with differing expansion rates causing cracking in the core. These requirements should therefore be designed to verify that the reactor doesn't have these issues. I would expect it to be something like this. The reactor starts at ambient temperature, 
either earth ambient or space ambient. The reactor is started and power is increased to full power. Full power is held for at least 15 minutes. The reactor is shut down. Hydrogen flow is continued until the reactor returns to the original temperature. That would much better simulate the use of the reactor in real world conditions. As for reaching these requirements, I suspect that this will be the area where going beyond NERVA will be the most important. The longest that NERVA ran at full power was just over an hour, and that was about 2500 Kelvin. There have been many startup shutdown tests. The XE Prime did 28 tests, but they only ran up to about 1300 Kelvin for many of them. There are many deliverables that go along with these requirements. The deliverables show that the Department of Energy has a very clear idea of how to build well-behaved reactors. First, there is the actual 30% design of the reactor. Then there is a performance analysis of the reactor. Does it meet the requirements? What are the stresses during startup, operation, and shutdown? And what will keep it from blowing up if your launch vehicle drops it in the ocean? There is a mass estimate, a very detailed mass estimate, of all the parts of the reactor. And then there are cost and schedule estimates. How much will it cost to build the reactor and how long will it take? They must define the interfaces between the reactor and the rest of the engine, describe the hydrogen flow, how the proper balance between nozzle cooling and turbo pump power is achieved, and which aspects of the system are most likely to cause issues. There is a description of instrumentation and control. The purpose of the control analysis will be to provide information that supports development of a system that safely controls the reactor and engine systems when they are linked together. The fission rate of the reactor is dependent upon the core design, the control drums that are used to control reactivity, the flow of hydrogen, which also affects reactivity, and other factors. There is a reactor manufacturing plan that describes how to build the reactor, how it is assembled into an actual engine, and what facilities are needed. There is a test plan that describes how the components and overall reactor will be tested and what facilities might be used. There is a quality assurance plan which will describe what requirements there should be for testing nuclear thermal reactors for spacecraft propulsion. And finally, there is a technology readiness assessment which details what technology development is required for this design to work and how the subcontractor will get there. This is a large number of deliverables and goes into much more depth than any of the designs that I've seen. Phase 2 takes the 30% design and pushes it to a 90% design, ready for another big review process. In addition, it requires the construction of a unit cell of the reactor core, basically enough of the core to be representative of the overall core design, at at least half scale. In a nervous style core, it would include the green fuel rods with hydrogen channels in them and the red and blue tie rods that structurally hold the core together. This is a test of, can you build this thing using the approach you say? The unit cells will be tested in operational reactors, such as the transient test reactor at Idaho National Laboratory or the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The point of this testing is to heat up the unit cells in a real reactor run hydrogen through them, and verify that they are well behaved under actual reactor conditions. They will very likely also be tested in NASA's In-Trees simulator, which heats hydrogen up to operating temperatures, 2700 Kelvin in this case, and verifies that the core designs can tolerate it. This is very useful as the cores do not become radioactive and can therefore be easily examined. Finally, phase three gets to real reactors. First, a reactor that is mostly identical to the final one, but with the enriched uranium replaced with either depleted uranium, the leftover from the enrichment process, or natural, unenriched uranium. It's a reactor that you could plug into the actual engine and everything would fit, except that it just wouldn't work. And then there's the final product, a reactor that is complete, including the appropriate enriched uranium. The fueled reactor prototype shall be suitable for use in nuclear testing of the reactor, designed for demonstration of the ability to control the reactor under a variety of normal operation and accident conditions. It's designed to be integrated into a rocket engine for real testing. Beyond phase three probably means an on-orbit test. What companies are involved? One of the requirements is that you need to include a company that, in the Department of Energy's opinion, knows how to deal with enriched uranium. So we will see companies that we aren't used to seeing in the space world. 
NASA awarded contracts to three groups of companies. The first partnership is WX Technologies, who are suppliers of fuel components and fuel, and Lockheed Martin, and Lockheed Martin who would obviously do the rockety part. Next up we have General Atomics, X Energy, and Aerojet Rocketdyne. A traditional nuclear company, a new nuclear company, and an experienced rocket engine company. Finally, the last partnership is a big group. A new nuclear company, Blue Origin, presumably for rockety stuff, GE Hitachi Nuclear, GE Research, Framatone, a French reactor company, and Materion, a high-performance materials company. I frankly don't see a good way to handicap these companies until we see what comes out of phase one, but I'm happy there are three groups. Perhaps the biggest surprise to me is that the phase one awards are only about five million each. There's a lot of detailed engineering work to be done for a small amount of money, so presumably these groups hope to see a lot more later. Here's a quick summary. NASA is asking for straightforward nuclear rocket engines that look doable with 1970s technology. There's nothing here that requires real advances. They are deliberately choosing a small engine size. They have realistic requirements for longevity and usability. It will be interesting to see if the different designs do bring new technology to the problem. If you enjoyed this video, please help me rhyme Framatone for a commemorative poem I am writing.